So I just want to take that statement in bold, how a free mind uh, creates a cheerfulness that reacts upon the whole system, <coughs> and then show it physiologically how it actually is mediated. Because it causes the blood to flow free, freely, and it tones up the entire system. And if it's toning up the entire system, that includes the neurons, which we are most concerned about. So, when, when an event happens that, that brings about happiness, and this peace comes from the truth, it's not happiness from morphine or cocaine. That's not the kind of happiness I'm talking about. We're going to refer to that in my next lecture. That there's, there's, there's some kind of high that is not healthy. But we're talking about the, the happiness that comes through the acknowledgement of the truth. When you have this sense of satisfaction that you have not compromised in any way, mm -hmm. that joy that comes, that inner joy that comes, is actually mediated by chemicals in the body. And then what we want to see now is what those chemicals do to other parts of the body in freeing up circulation and all that. So when this event happens, you come here to a prophecy school, you attend a, le a lesson, and you feel that you have embraced all the aspects of it, of, of, of that truth for that day. You feel this joy within you that at least you've understood something. It stimulates a nerve in your brain. And that nerve will go and stimulate a certain organ in your, in your body that will release a hormone. And these various hormones, we're going to list them down. The happy hormones, what are they? Serotonin. Serotonin. <laughs> Which other one? Endorphin. Endorphin.
the lack of it might cause lack of attention, lack of concentration, and bad moods. Mm. It can be released by eating certain foods. For example, foods rich in proteins. The reason why we are advised not to eat meat is precisely because um, it. Have you noticed that it's very difficult for people to get off meat? That is much more than just a food. People don't refer to it nowadays as, you know, a like, a like food. They refer it to it as my meat. <laughs> <laughs> They've developed this personal relationship. Meat has become like a person that they love. Is here. That you can flip over onto the other side where it becomes destructive. Because we'll come back to the endorphins and you will notice that when we do this, uh, the lesson on doubt, how that dopamine is used in a negative way to actually cause us to doubt God. So that's why I read this first statement, that this piece we are talking about is the one that comes through the study of the Word of God. Right, what else do we say about dopamine? Dopamine mediates the positive emotions and helps you to feel mentally alert. The lack of it might cause lack of attention, lack of concentration, and bad moods. Okay, I think that was just a typo. Phenylethamine is the hormone that results in the feelings we get in the early stages of, rela of a relationship. Everybody knows those, re those feelings are unique, they are so somehow different from everything else. It's because they are not mediated by dopamine or endorphin, they are mediated by phenyl ethyl. So that kind of a high is, uh, this is the chemical that's responsible for it. Gurlin is a hormone that reduces stress and can help you become more relaxed. And it's released when we become hungry. That's why eating too much is not always a good idea. Just eat according to your body's need and never fill your stomach completely in order to maintain good girling levels. Because if they are, if they are excessive, if it's slightly over the normal, you're going to get addicted to that feeling. Mm -hmm. We know so many people suffer from eating disorders, especially people overeat because they love to eat. And this love is not natural, it's an addiction. They can't control their eating habits and they end up eating too much because girling makes you feel good. When you're eating, that feeling you have, you know, I, I, it's difficult to find somebody losing their temper when they're eating. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I can say <laughs> Maybe in some cases, but uh, I don't really come across it. So, these are the happy hormones in the body, and we want them to be stimulated by a love for truth. Amen. Um, because then we are guaranteed that it's within the normal levels. It's not too low, it's not too high to cause an addiction. So, what are the effects then? How does it uh, tone up the, the body? How does it improve the circulation of the blood? It's because all these hormones combine together, it's so complex, um, I'm not sure if we have a full understanding of everything. But, happiness protects the heart, okay, and it prolongs life, therefore. Because in, in um, I think it is in, the, in lecture number 7, I'll be talking about vital capacity. How we are all born <coughs> in a vital capacity and it, it expires, uh, um, you know, its duration depends on how quickly we use it up. So, um, obviously, if you have a strong heart, that means you may live longer, right? Because happiness, what happiness does is it regulates the heart rate and the blood pressure. And, and these, these are functions of the heart. They give you an index of how well the heart is. What, what is the normal blood pressure? Where do we want our blood pressure to be? 120, 127. Yeah, okay, about 120, 70. 
And what's, what's the best heart rate? What's your heart rate? 70. 70 is normal, but it can be even better than 70. If you find a really fit athlete, their heart rates can be even as low as 40. Yes. A fit person, if you're fit, your heart rate should be slow. It should not be fast. It's fast, you're using up your vital capacity. Mm -hmm. If you want to check what your heart rate is, just check your pulse and count how many beats you get in 15 seconds and multiply by 4. Yeah? Then you know what your heart rate is per minute. So ideally, it should be between 40 and a heart rate of 70 is normal in the, in the, in the world generally, but we should be aiming for 40 to 60. And then there is what they call heart rate variability. Your heart rate when you're sitting and resting, okay, let's say it's about 60, will change when you get up to walk, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because now your muscles have to are coming into play and they need to require oxygen. So your heart rate should pick up. Maybe I go to about 70 or 72 or 5. So the difference between your resting heart rate and your walking heart rate is what is the is called the heart rate variability. And that should not be too great. If it's too great, it implies a dysfunction that maybe the blood vessels are not as flexible as they need to be to accommodate the changes. So your blood pressure shoots up when you get up to walk. Your arteries should be flexible enough to accommodate that extra pressure. Your heart rate may go up slightly, but it will come back to normal. Um, so this heart rate variability, if you want to have a good heart rate variability, you need to study the truth. Because it promotes um, the happy hormones, which improve the heart rate variability. <coughs> You will see that if, if the difference is too large, that's a bad sign. It means you're using up your vital capacity quicker. Right? <coughs> yeah. What does happiness also do? What we're going to see is that this lesson is the opposite, the exact opposite of the previous lesson. Is that heart rate improves the immune system. In a number of ways, one study found that when people are exposed to cold and flu viruses, they are less likely to get sick, and if they do, they exhibit fewer symptoms. Happy people exhibit fewer symptoms, and they are less likely to get sick. So I think in this movement, we should be seeing less and less flus, and if people do get flu, the symptoms are less and they resolve real quick mm -hmm. because of, of the fact that the immune system is boosted every time we come here and study light. <coughs> a team of researchers at UCLA showed that people with a deep sense of happiness and well-being had lower levels of inflammatory gene expression and stronger antiviral and antibody responses. Um, and this is a new realm of study. They are calling it epigenetics. How your genes change depending on your, um, not only the environment you're living in, but your sense of well-being. How happy you are can change your genes. Genes are not stagnant. They change depending on the environment in which you are. So a prophecy school is a good place to be. We've seen it promotes happiness. It will change the profile of your immune system genes. So, so that you, you're, you're going to be producing these genes that are going to produce immune cells, the appropriate immune cells in the right quantities. So that when you are attacked by viruses or bacteria, these cells are ready. Present. So, Sister 
White says in CS 14, paragraph 2, the spirit of liberality in the, in, is the spirit of heaven. <coughs> Christ's self-sacrificing love is revealed upon the cross that man might be saved. He gave all that he had and then gave himself. The cross of Christ appeals to the benevolence of every <coughs> follower of the blessed Savior. The principle there illustrated is to give, give. <coughs> this carried out in actual benevolence and good works is the true fruit of the Christian life. The principle of wild things is to get, get, and thus they expect to secure happiness. But carried out in all these bearings, the fruit is misery and death. Mm -hmm. So what this what this study actually showed before I read the statement is that it's not just any happiness that will trigger this um, gene transformation. It is only the happiness that comes from serving others. It's not the happiness that comes from seeking for self-gratification. So people go forth thinking they'll be happy because they're going to make a lot of money or um, have a lot of power, uh, seeking to derive happiness from getting, getting, that's not the one that triggers the happy hormones. In fact, what we are seeing now is that that triggers what? Cortisol. Mm -hmm. It triggers stress. Because that's not how God made us. God made us that we <coughs> cultivate self-sacrificing love. And it's only when you render <coughs> service to another person that you feel a real sense of joy. Amen. But the one that comes through the acquisition of material things, it only brings misery and death because we have seen that cortisol can kill. And I think in this world today, the only way to make money is that you've got to, um, like in the vision of Ellen White where she saw the two crowns, you've got to be trampling over others and disregarding the needs of others for you to get there. And that is really against the nature that God gave us. Mm -hmm. It is through self-sacrificing love that we will experience this true joy. Amen. And it may require you to give up everything that you have. Mm -hmm. But by giving, then you, you, you know, you're getting all your, your endorphins and, 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 and all these happy hormones in the right quantities and for the right purpose. And then these hormones, what they also do is they, they counteract cortisol. They lower the levels of cortisol. Mm -hmm. So actually when you're in the midst of a stressful situation, like maybe you're grieving or you're worrying, what's, what's the ninth law of health? After the last new start, what's the ninth one that is usually not <laughs> Anyone heard of it? You got your new start, the eight laws, but there's a ninth one. They call it benevolence. Oh yeah? Someone recognizes it. There's a law of benevolence. After trusting God, it's benevolence. And what they say is that if you have a patient in a sanitarium and you want them to recover quickly, the best way to do it is to get them to care for another patient who's in a worse condition. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's two things that will happen. Their attention is removed from themselves to the person that's worse than themselves. So what, that does, what does that do to worry and anxiety about me and my condition? You see now, because you're seeing yourself in a better situation, so you begin to view yourself in a better light. And you now obviously begin to cultivate hope and patience because you're handling someone who's worse than yourself. So what happens in that case, and as you see yourself improving the life of this person that's worse off than yourself, you're now pumping up your endorphins. And the endorphins will kill your pain. What else will they do? They, they, they improve your immune system, which is the very machine that you need to deal with your disease. That's why the law of benevolence is, 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 is the last one there that I, I'm familiar with. A very critical law that in a sanitarium get the patients to take care of other patients. Right. 
And dolphins also, what they do is that um, they have this fantastic benefit. So when you've got endorphins on board, your perception of symptoms is higher. How is that a benefit? Let's say you, you have flu, so you have headache. <coughs> no, let me put it this way. Before you have full-blown flu symptoms, there will be signs. <coughs> And sometimes we do not have the ability to pick up those signs in our bodies. Because when is it best to deal with a disease? Before you get it or after you get it? Before. Before. So which means that you need to have the ability to detect pre mm -hmm. symptoms. Mm -hmm. And we've actually been designed by God that way. That we should be able to listen to our bodies and pick up subtle changes in heart rate, in um, temperature, um, before you get a headache, you will feel a heaviness. Mm -hmm. But you know, in many cases we miss these symptoms, or we begin to perceive them, but because they are not overt, we just ignore them. And you know the brain does what you tell it. If you tell it to ignore a symptom, it will do that. Mm -hmm. And you will very soon push that behind your, you know, behind your conscious <coughs> level and forget about it. That's how we sometimes abuse our bodies. It's not intentional, but it's not a good thing not to be able to pick up these subtle changes within your own self. Because is, is this is this house as Elder Muhammad calls it? It's your house, you live in it. And when there's changes occurring in it, you should be able to pick them up. One of the reasons why we're not able to pick them up is we don't have enough endorphins flowing around. The happy hormones are the ones that help us to pick up these subtle changes. So you can see how this chronic low grade kind of depression that we might all be experiencing in a stressful world you know, breaks down these hormones and then we, we're not even able to, to listen to ourselves. Um, I have an autoimmune condition that I suffer from, battling with it since I was a teenager, from years now, over 30. And what I'm noticing is, is that I, I, because of this um, inability, I, I, I'm not, I don't think I have enough endorphins on board, so I don't pick up these subtle changes. I pick it up when it's too late, just a little bit too late. Because when I begin to feel pain, then I know I've lost the game. There is nothing at that point I can do to stop it. It will go all the way, full blown. And I'm praying that now God gives me the ability to pick it up a few stages before. Because when, when now you've got the immune system so messed up, and then the condition you know, comes out into the open, what he's going to do is dramatically take away your sense of concentration, your memory, you, you, your brain is going to be foggy, not able to put facts together, and then you're going to suffer. You're going to, your mind begins to, 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 to work on a low level and you're not able to retain information. So, we want to cultivate this spirit of benevolence and the spirit of joy that comes through the reception of this truth so that our endorphins assist us in having this higher perception of subtle changes within our bodies so that you can fight the flu before it, it breaks you down. Mm -hmm. Flu is, um, by the way, it's, it's, it's sort of like seen as a mild condition but it's very, very expensive on the immune system. And it's one of the things that reduces our vital capacity. So it might not kill you, but it will reduce your lifespan. It has that capacity. So flu is not something we should take lightly. Pick up the symptoms beforehand and address them. And with something as simple as water, if you pick up a subtle change in your system, even heart rate, if you feel that your heart rate is slightly higher, you can sense it, 
or if you feel your temperature is getting a little bit high, just drink lots of water and you will see those symptoms begin to settle. Yes? I just wanted to ask, there's this perception that um, every year one needs to get the flu and so, yeah, because changes of season, changes of uh, things like that. Uh, so is that true? Is that actually can one live without the flu? Yeah. Yeah? Yes. So, we don't need a hectic explanation about that. Because once you've understood vital capacity and the things that spend vital capacity, it's flu, one of them. Getting flu, every time you have a flu, it wears down the, this vital capacity. So we don't want to get it flu every year. It's not a good idea. So, <coughs> the speed of prophecy gives us um, various ways in which we can actually cultivate the spirit of benevolence or cultivate these, um, um, these happy moments other than, of course, studying um, the reform lines. And I think we've looked at one. One is giving, Matthew 5, 42. And the other one is relating. And uh, this is from Genesis 29, verse 18. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve the seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. So, God has created us to be social beings, to relate <coughs> in family circles and in marriage, to love one another. I think even that's the instruction we're given as brethren, to love one another. So, in this movement, we don't have to be sat with a low stick. We need to love one another. In cultivating that love for one another, it, 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 it improves the, the happy home and profile. And because in loving, What's really involved in loving? Giving. When you love someone, you're giving of yourself. I think in the world it's misunderstood, and maybe we've come away from the world with some of those false ideas. But love is about giving, giving of yourself. And that's what stimulates endorphins. Exercise is another one. The more we exercise, the better will be the circulation of the blood. More people die for want of exercise than through over fatigue. Very many may rust out than wear out. Mm. This is in two testimonies, five to six. It's better for you to spend time. We were created to move, to be on the move. The only time you should be um, sedentary is when you're sleeping. But the world is cultivating this culture of sleeping. That's why we go, we go study. And where, where do we study? In classrooms like this. What's a, no, what's a typical um, school day today? Other than where I studied at an Adventist boarding school, we had two hours of work every day. Um, but every other school, students sit in classroom <coughs> from 7 to 3. And then in Uganda, where I come from, the education system is so intense. Primary school children wake up at five and go to bed at nine. Mm -hmm. Yes, because they have to be in school at seven and they study until three, then they take extra lessons until five, then they go home and do homework, then they go to bed. <laughs> and their small children there are of primary school. And it is a very destructive lifestyle. You get through that lifestyle from grade 1 to 7, then you go to varsity and continue with that lifestyle, then you go into the corporate world and sit 8 hours every day. Mm -hmm. This sedentary lifestyle, that's why I'm like, Satan has a plan for the end of the world and it has caught up on us in ignorance, you know. The church has taken us back into Egypt. And we were not taught many of these things, you know, and we are all, you know, sort of went through this education system and going through the work, working environment and continuing this sedentary lifestyle that is so detrimental to the human body, very destructive. God is calling us out of it in order for us to embrace these truths because exercising this body was created to move. That's why a person who has arthritis, what? What are the symptoms of arthritis besides pain? 
Yeah, what do you call what do you call that? It's stiff. It's stiff. Yeah. When they go to bed, they wake up in the morning with morning stiffness. That's because the body has not been moving for a couple of hours. And when the body does not move enough the way it should, and it lacks much of the minerals, because the food we are eating today also is not optimal, it's not providing us with all the minerals that we need, then we suffer from stiffness of muscles and joints, and exercise the best medicine for that. Not only does it promote endorphins, but it allows the body to remain toned up and improve circulation. Um, Ministry of Healing, page 251, paragraph 6, it says, No tongue can express, no finite mind can conceive the blessing that results from appreciating the goodness and the love of God. Even on earth, we may have a joy as a wellspring, never failing, because fed by the streams that go from the throne of God. This, um, <coughs> this aspect of appreciating the love of God also gives endorphins. And it's, it's not possible to do it in the cities. That's why country living is necessary. The only place you can appreciate the goodness and love of God is in the countryside. In the city, everything is provided for you. What are you going to appreciate God about? You know, it's only when you move into the country that you realize that what it takes to have water. What it takes to dispose of waste. When you come face to face with yourself and who you really are, that can only happen in the countryside. Because in the city, there is a system there that's already built. Most people move into the cities and buy a house. Not build a house, buy a house. But that house is already fully built, okay? It has a plumbing system. You don't even know where the pipes run. It has water coming in and electricity. And I, I, I came to appreciate this fact when, when we are sitting down and thinking that we want to move to a farm and there's no toilet there. There's no plumbing system. And then we begin to um, investigate all the alternatives. <coughs> what you can do, what you can begin with and how you can advance on that. And realize that you're going to come face to face with you, who you are. And it's, it's in nature <coughs> that you begin to see things in, in their real context, you know. <laughs> because waste disposal and water supply and power, you know, when, when you're out in the country, you will have to look at the nature around you. And that's when you, you for the first time, notice what kind of a tree is standing in front of you mm -hmm. and what the aspects of that tree is. Mm -hmm. This is when you see God. When you wake up in the morning and you hear the sound of the birds, you know, we've just recently acquired a piece of land out there in the country. Every Sunday we go there to clear up trees and there's this bird that I noticed. It comes and starts singing and then I started responding to it. So when it sings, 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 I say, hi, and then it goes quiet. And I know, okay, it's heard me. We can establish a communication here. But then, in that just small experience, I'm able to really appreciate the power of God and learn that birds that are vegan are the only birds that can see. Yes. You will notice that birds that are uh, carnivorous, they don't sing, they just croak and they <laughs> So we want to, to be among the hundred and four thousand and sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. We need to be vegan. How we cultivate the dolphins, next step is trying out. PC374, PC374, let men receive a mold of character in the school of Christ. 
learning meekness and lowliness of heart from Jesus, and they will be less self-sufficient, less self-confident, and will not have too high an opinion of their own ability, but will be regarded by those in the office as Christian brethren, walking humbly with God, trying to serve in whatever capacity they can. They can do the most good without trying to exalt themselves. So in trying, in uh, learning the meekness and loneliness of Christ, and then trying in that spirit to serve others is the most good to be gained. Because what happens when you try out something for the first time on the neural level? You've never done something before? Maybe you've never played an instrument and then you develop an in interest or you learn and discover that it's a good idea for each person to learn to play an instrument because it develops certain aspects of your faculty, mind faculty. And now you have to learn how to play an instrument. It's a new skill for you. What must happen in the neural level? What must you establish? First of all, a neuron must grow, right? So there has to be neural genesis. And then, obviously, it's not just one nerve that is involved in the playing of an instrument. It's a multitude of nerves. All of them need to connect with each other. Because if you're learning to play something like a guitar or a, or, a, or a piano, you notice that there are various different keys. And your mind has to understand all of that. And that with a guitar you need to strum, your fingers need to begin to accommodate themselves to the instrument. It's not easy to learn, especially when you're an adult, when you've already reached adulthood, to learn to flex your fingers right. I hear that it's a problem. I tried to do it and I realized it is a problem. It's easy, easier acquired during childhood. But your mind can still learn it. Yeah? You can still learn to do it. But that will require a nerve to be created and then connections to be made between the various nerves. In order for you to now acquire this skill to be able to read the music, understand it, and then interpret it in the language of the guitar or the piano. It's about, it's about taking two languages and learning both of them and then combining them. The language of the music and the language of the instrument. Yeah. And those skills, by the way, each one of us in trying to develop our minds, we need to try to learn an instrument if you can. Yeah. You, you don't have to like it. <laughs> yeah. But it will develop certain aspects of your mind. Yes. <clears throat> it's, it's advised, actually. So, in trying new things out, what will happen when you learn to play your first chord? You have this sense of satisfaction, which stimulates the endorphins. And then, you know, all the effects that follow. So, Christ is, 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 is giving us this counsel. Not being confident, overconfident in ourselves, but being willing to try out and um, in whatever capacity that you're called into by God to, pull, to try and serve. You might not have the skill, but try and develop it. The other thing is to have direction. There is nothing as dis destructive as not having direction in your life. Because what direction does is, is neurogenesis. It stimulates neurogenesis. And that, that's really what we are trying to do. It says um, in CHL, page 17, paragraph 1, the work of God calls for men of high moral powers to engage in his promulgation. Men are wanted whose hearts are nerved with holy fervor, men of strong purpose who are not easily moved, who can lay down every selfish interest and give all for the cross and the crown. The cause of present truth is suffering for men who are loyal to a sense of right and duty, whose moral integrity is firm and whose energy is equal to the opening providence of God. And I think this is why we are here. We have a love for this truth, but it's not enough to love it. 
we are to have a purpose in it. Because having a purpose, what does it allow you to do? As far as your mind faculties are concerned. If you have a, a goal that you're working towards, let's say you decide to start a ministry. You've never been involved in such an endeavor. What mind faculties are going to be required for you? To have to start a ministry and get it up and running. Creativity. Sorry? Creativity. Okay, yeah. Creativity, what else? Can I add planning? Can I add initiation? Why is this so important? Because we hear time and time over, uh, 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 again people having huge plans. Everything is perfect on paper. But do we not suffer from that disability? Uh, we are able to plan and everything looks good, but implementation is a problem. It's a, it's a, it's a property of the mind that may not be developed. And when you put yourself in an environment now where you're going to be forced to begin to think in that direction, you just might develop it. Yeah, so I'm just trying to show that if you have a purpose in life, if you have a goal in life, it's good for you. So we should quickly get ourselves into, in terms of this message, I'm propagating, because this is what she's saying, God wants a people that are not going to be moved um, that can promulgate this message. And there are, it can be done in various ways. It doesn't have to be a ministry specifically. It can be anything. I don't know. You'll have to be creative about it. The spirit of resilience. This comes from ML 53, paragraph 3. Long suffering is patience with offense, long endurance. If you are long suffering, you will not impart to others your supposed knowledge of your brother's mistakes and errors. You will seek to help and save him because he has been purchased with the blood of Christ. Tell him <coughs> his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering your, thyself lest thou also be tempted. To be long-suffering is not to be gloomy and sad, sour and hard-hearted. It is to be exactly the opposite. So we need to cultivate the spirit of patience and long-suffering. If you are having to deal with a brother or a sister um, who's not in agreement, or a family member, or a spouse, or a child, that we need to cultivate a, a, a spirit of long suffering. Because in this, you will be forced to see this person as a person that's purchased by the blood of Christ. So, once you establish that, your whole approach is going to change. Because you'll be trying to win them. And you go down on your knees and pray and seek for wisdom from the Lord to recover this person, this family member, this individual that you love. They may not be in error, they may be in rebellion, they may be, you know, might be a child who's rebellious. <coughs> that we are to cultivate patience. Because in cultivating patience, we are actually not only gaining a brother, in the, in the end, which is going to stimulate our endorphins. But we are also building up these neurons of patience. And it means, it doesn't mean that we have to be gloomy and sad. Yeah. So in trials, we, we are not called upon to be gloomy and sad because you know what that will cause. <clears throat> it's going to cause a, a cortisol effect. The next one is emotions. Christ and Him crucified should be the theme of contemplation. CSA, page 28, paragraph 4. Um, Christ and Him crucified should be the theme of contemplation, of conversation, and of our most joyful emotion. We should keep in our thoughts every blessing 
we receive from God. And when we realize His great love, we should be willing to trust everything to the hand that was nailed to the cross of Christ. So, I know that we, we, we learned this morning that loving the truth is not something that um, might be natural with us. But we can cultivate it to love Christ. And the way we do that, because we saw that the more you use a neuron, the more the mind and sheets go around it, is that Christ should constitute the, 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 the theme of our contemplation and our thoughts and our joyful emotions. The only way we can do that is by beholding Him in His Word, in His truth. The next one is acceptance or thankful. At the um, Colossians 3.15 and let the peace of God rule in your heart, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be thankful. And it's not just thankful because something good has happened. We need to cultivate confidence in God. That even when it's something bad that's happening, to cultivate the spirit of thankfulness. <coughs> because if you don't know what God is trying to do with you. And you might not have full understanding like Job. The thing is to cooperate and, and, and have a spirit of thankfulness. Because that thankfulness, once you accept this trial that you're in, it provokes a completely different set of emotions within you. Instead of becoming depressed and, and pull yourself down, instead you're going to cultivate joy and happiness and contentment. So cortisol goes down in your system and the dopings go up. And they will promote, as we have seen, a general sense of well-being, even in the midst of a trial. And at that point, you can be able to say, though he's laying here, to I trust him. And I think the best solution to a stressful situation is to just leave it to the God. Because in most cases, we may not really have a good understanding of what God is trying to do. Whether he's testing us, <coughs> or trying to get us to develop a character trait, or a talent. You know, so if we are anxious and impatient with him, he may not be able to finish that work. So the best thing in a trial is to cultivate thankfulness. I thank you, Lord, because I, you know, I don't know what you're doing, but thank you. And the minute you express those words, because, you know, your brain is your words. What you say is what you become. If you say, uh, if you are always expressing sadness, you will develop a sad countenance. If your brain reflects your feelings and your emotions, by saying thank you to the Lord, it immediately provokes endorphins. And you end up actually literally feeling better about the situation. Commitment. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Genesis 2.24. Deuteronomy 11.22. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments that I have, that I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him. If you make a commitment today in this camp, that you put away sin and serve the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, you will begin on the path of happiness that's going to build up to the end. And this happiness is not only going to improve your mind faculties so that when you sit in a prophecy class you can grasp and be able to recall, but also it will improve your immune system and you will get less flu, less symptoms, your vital capacity will remain high because we know this is the last generation, isn't it? There shouldn't be another generation after this. Christ should come in our lifetime, and which is soon, I presume, from what we are seeing in the lines. So, in what condition do you want Christ to meet you in your physical body? How strong do you want to be? Do you want to be weighed down and sickly and dying? I think God is calling us to be vibrant and healthy, physically fit, whatever our condition is. It's when you make this commitment, if you make a commitment to the Lord, a purpose today as Daniel did, 
because he purposed, which means that he made up his mind to do what was right. It's the only way to move forward, brethren. If you don't make a commitment, you will keep going backwards. Because if you make a commitment to do, to today, God works with you. But God cannot do the work and then you are catching up later. Because in, in making a commitment, these are the things, I'm reading for you the stuff that promotes endorphins. It's a commitment as well. It's included in that list of things that we need to do. If we are half and half, we love this message, but we don't want to make a full commitment. We're going to provoke cortisol because it's going to create anxiety in the system. And the last one is forgiving others. The reason why God calls us to forgive others is because you will not hold a grudge. And if you're not holding a grudge, you're not going to be suffering with cortisol issues of anxiety and stress and fear. <clears throat> so I hope that um, I have um, exhausted the issue of stress and how it affects our minds so that we will not receive the, the word of God and also show on the opposite side how we are to cultivate happiness because happiness is going to help us to embrace this, this message. Um, so if there are no questions, we can pray. The time is up. Thank you.